Do you have a life verse? Online, do you have a life verse? Alcove, you have a life verse? Anybody have a life verse? Come on, tell us what it is. Just somebody raise your hand, I'll point to you. You just say it nice and loud. A life verse, you know, a life verse, a verse that means something to you. You, you have it on a plaque in your house. It came to you in a time of your life. Teresa, what's yours? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's from Joshua. Yes. Uh-huh. That's right. You're doing great. Amen. All things that will happen for those who believe. John 11, 40. Come on, let's give God praise, right? So life verses, I'm sure if, if I really gave you the opportunity, we went Phil Donahue style, it would give you the microphone and you'd be able to say it. But life verses mean something to us because it's like when the word of God jumps off the page and all of a sudden, how many people, you've been reading the Bible and all of a sudden the word was just like the right time. It was just amazing and it just spoke to you. Well, this is one of my life verses. And if you've been coming to church for a long time, you know my story. But this life verse came along with Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. It's funny because um, on May 3rd, my son Dom will be graduating from the University of Valley Forge. And uh, that's crazy. Parents with young kids, it goes by way too quick. And I remember my time at the University of Valley Forge, it was 1995, 1996, specifically that year. I was there from 94 to 98. And it was 95 and 96 where my life hit rock bottom. I went into school knowing that I was called to be a pastor. And when I went to school, the Lord was asking me to release something to him and I was disobedient. I justified bringing certain things with me when I went to school. Best way I could say it was it was a relationship that God told me I, couldn't, I, I should let, let go of. And I didn't think in my own mind, my own understanding, that anybody would love me. I was 19, 18, 19 years old. My hair was already falling off. It wasn't looking good for me. And I felt like I already put all this investment, and I had a little bit of insecurity, I guess. Let's just admit it. Even guys have insecurity. That's why we lie about the size of the fish that we catch. Oh, it was 20 feet long. Me, well, it was six inches. And, um, you know, so I had a little bit of insecurity, and I said, God, how can you ever find me anybody else? And so I was justifying to God why I should keep on something he asked me to release. And then, as a result, I wound up paying the consequence. How many people have ever paid the consequence for holding on to something God asked you to release. And it's like trying to hold on to like a, a, an alligator. It just, it just lashes you. And it wasn't the fault of the other person. It was just the fault of my own disobedience. It was like Jonah where you were just running from the will of God. It got so bad that I, I wound up, I was playing baseball, and we had, a, we, had a, uh, we had no home field at Valley Forge at that time. And so all of our games were away, and the professors never gave you credit for missing class, so we would have to miss our classes. On top of that, I was working in a restaurant almost 40 hours a week. I was trying to keep up with my work. I had C's in the classes, but what happens is every time you cut over the allotted amount, they would take points off your grade. So between baseball and going into a little bit of a depression because of my disobedience, my grades in certain classes went from C's to F's. I failed three classes. And I was going to go home and face that woman who's sitting in the alcove right now. She looks peaceful. But let me tell you something. When the right hand is inserted into the mouth and she starts talking to you like this through her teeth, you know you're dead. And I was going to have to go to my parents. And now being a parent, knowing that college costs money, I, I'm, I, I have no idea why you didn't kill me. Like dad didn't say, oh, we're going to take you out to the back and let you go. You know, like... I would have killed me. And how many people are grateful that the Holy Spirit speaks to parents, amen? And somehow my parents understood the call of God on my life, and they didn't let me go. They, they allowed me to go back to school, but it was in chapel that a Navy chaplain shared Jeremiah 29, 11, and then after the thing I was holding on to, you know, blew up in my face, and I wondered if God had anything for me, it was in a devotional time, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 jumped off the page, and I said to myself, 
I said, Lord, I said, this has been in the Bible all these years and I never knew it. Have you ever had that moment where like something's in the Bible and you're like, this has been in here all the time and now oh, this is amazing, this is a great verse. And somehow the Holy Spirit used it to remind me, my own understanding, everything I was using to justify keeping things in my life that God didn't want, my own understanding was, was, was flawed. But if I would trust in the Lord, he would direct my paths. And the interesting thing is, in 1995, I also met Rachel Parati. I walked into a class and I saw her and I said, I said, there's something about her that the, the Lord said this to me. It's crazy. Now, this is not like desperation because we met in October and I didn't, you know, I, I low keyed riz that whole thing up until April. Okay. Some of you got that. See, I've been hanging around the youth. They've been teaching me. That's valid. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So, um. We met in October, and when I saw her, the Lord said to me, that's the type of woman you need to marry. And it wasn't, she's new, you need, but have you ever heard, felt something about somebody's countenance, where you just know that they're different, where the fruit is, is just evident? And it was on April 17th, 1996, which was her birthday. She said to me a couple of days earlier, I'm fond of you. And I said, what do you mean by fond? Because how many people know guys are dumb? You could, you could hint that you like them, but they still won't believe it until like, you put it in writing with an attorney and a, and a notary. I was like, what do you mean by, by fond? What do you mean fond? Like, can you give me the definition? Can you give me the root of the word? It was like a spelling bee. And so it was April 17th, and we were on the phone. I got home from work, and we were on the phone all night long, and it was somewhere around 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning where I said, what do you mean fun? And, and then I said, all right, listen, if I'm going to jump into this pool, I'm going all in. I said, well, listen, you're fond of me. Well, guess what? I'm crazy about you. And she says, I am too. I was like, yes! <laughs> and since April 17th, 1996, I've had the privilege of, being Rachel's soulmate. And when I look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it's because I didn't think God had anything for me. But if I acknowledge him and I surrendered everything in all my ways, in all his ways, all my ways I would acknowledge him, he would direct my path. He directed me to Rachel. Rachel found the job posting. The job posting brought me here. And I've been here 26 years, one wife, one church. And now here's the deal. In my life in that moment, that scripture was amazing, but that scripture has had to become reality to me over and over again, because how many people know you could see God come through 20 years ago, but when you're in the middle of, a, a, of Italy in an ambulance and you think you're going to die, that scripture takes on new meaning and you got to learn it all over again. And so I want to share with you as briefly as I can, what does it mean to really trust the Lord? And once you can trust somebody, it changes the relationship. It brings it to a new level. I want you to write this down. Relationships, Stephen Covey said this, relationships move at the speed of trust. So the only way you can truly trust somebody is to spend time with them and get to know them. I want you to think about this. Who do you trust the most in your life? Who do you trust more than anyone in your life right now outside of God? It's probably the people that you've spent the most time with. I, I look at the staff who's here, and, and, and many of which I've been with over 20 years. They know everything about me. Like, they even know my social security number, which, which is kind of sus, but I trust them. They know everything about me. They make my plane reservations. I can't fire them because if I do, they'll write a book about me, so I have to keep them on staff. No, just kidding. It's true. Lisey just, <laughs> she's got a whole notepad, praise God. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that you trust people because you spend time with them and you, you start to, when you spend time with people, you know everything about them. Well, the same thing is true of God. You can't trust God unless you really abide in the beauty of Jesus and have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And trusting the Lord with all of our heart is the opposite of doubting God, fearing outcomes, ignoring the truth and the promises of his word. In Proverbs 3, 5, 30, verse 5, in the NLT, it says this, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. And, and one of the ways we trust God is that we have relationships 
relationship, not just with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but we have relationship with the Word of God. Because the primary way that the Holy Spirit speaks to us is through the Word. And when you have a relationship with the Word, I'm not talking about reading the Word for credit, because we all know what it's like to read the Bible, go through our devotional plans, and then forget what we just read. I'm talking about when you consume the Word, when you abide in the Word. In John 15, it says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And we need to understand, trust in the Lord comes from the foundation of having a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit through his word. Life verses pop up because the Holy Spirit brings it to your attention. And when you trust God, it's you see his word comes to life. Every word of God proves true. Can somebody say amen to that? He's never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. All things work together for the good of those who love and serve him. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Has anybody experienced that in your life where you've seen the word of God prove true that when you tithe, he opens up the floodgates of heaven and pours out blessing on your life that you can't contain. That the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Easter Sunday, Rachel was on her way to church. I was about to preach the second service. I forgot my phone. Al gets a call on his phone. Rachel was in a car accident. And after I found that everybody was okay, what happened? And I looked at the car. And I looked where Rebecca was sitting, right behind Rachel. And Rachel and Rebecca and Dom got hit on the two doors on the driver's side. And I just think, what would have happened if they got hit at a higher rate? What would have happened if the car was going faster? And I thank God on Easter Sunday that as we were getting ready to minister, the angel of the Lord was around that car and protected by two girls. Now, Dominic, he'd need more of a Mack truck to hurt him, but at least God, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I feel bad for the car, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just kidding, okay. Why do they call him Little Dom, you know? <laughs> I'm little Dom now. Anyway, he's taller than me. He's, he's awesome. I love my boy. But what I'm saying is, is that God protected my family, and he even protected the driver of the other car. And praise the Lord, after my litigational skills and taking photo evidence of the crash scene, the accident was not our fault, 100% liability of the other driver. Thank you, I rest my case, Your Honor. The favor of the Lord. <laughs> it wasn't me, it was God. And I think about what started off as an annoyance could have been a tragedy, but all things work together for the good. You got to realize you start to trust God when you start to see the word of God come alive. And every scripture, every word of God proves true. He's not a man that he would lie. Trusting in the Lord involves surrender. Surrender. Surrendering our anxieties, our worries, our fears, our ideologies, our agendas, our doubts, and everything to the Lord. Matthew 6, 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Luke, Adam, Cotignola. Because you know what he's going to ask after church. What are we eating? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, trusting is surrendering to God to say, if you could take care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how much more will you take care of me? Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. You need to understand part of trust is also being able to articulate your heart to the Lord. If you keep it in, have you ever kept anything in and not told anybody and then it eats away at you? Have you ever kept anything in and, and, and it, just, it, just, it just consumes you? I'm here to tell you God is big enough 
Not only take your prayers, but what does he say? Your petitions. You know what your petitions are? I don't like the way this feels. I don't like what's going on. I feel like you've deserted me. I don't think this is fair. Are you even real? Is your word true? And some of you are nervous that I'm even talking like that, but here's the deal. You could either keep those fears in, then you know what happens? The biggest battlefield is between your ears. When you keep those fears in, the enemy knows that you're thinking those things, and he will get with you in your mind. He said, didn't the Lord say, or if the Lord really loved you, or why is somebody else getting the breakthrough and you're not? You see, when you keep in doubt, when you keep in anxiety, when you keep in fear, when you keep in this isn't fair, when you keep in your doubts about God and you don't give them to him, they become a cancer inside of you that the enemy takes advantage of. Oh, but when you give God not only your prayer, Lord, we need a breakthrough. Lord, we need help with our finances. Lord, I need a healing. Lord, I need a restoration. When you not only give him your prayer requests, but you give him your petitions, how you don't like it, how it makes you feel, why you think it's unfair, why you feel it's injustice, you got to give him the good, the bad, and the ugly because he's big enough to handle everything because he's God. And what does scripture say? And when you do that, the peace of God. Everybody say peace. <laughs> let's, let's, go, let's go old school. Peace be with you. And come on now. Uh, give each other the sign of peace. Amen. This is COVID peace. You just go like that to somebody. Amen. But it says the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Have any of you ever felt a peace that is beyond where you, like, like people are like, how could you be happy? That transcends all this thing. What does it say? It guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Has, you, have you, has your heart ever hurt? It needs a guard. Amen. Has your mind ever run wild on you? It needs a guard. Amen. And how many people are grateful when you release to God and you trust him and you say, Lord, it's in your hands. He gives you peace and he gives you a guard of your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Notice it's not, okay, here's your peace. Go ahead. Go, kids. Go off to school. No. In Christ Jesus. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. We abide in the beauty of Jesus because apart from him we can do nothing. Trust is meaning this. God, I not only trust you with my life, I walk with you in my life. I bring you into every room of my life, and I have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? First Peter 5, 6 to 10, it says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know... That your family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. One of the things about trusting God is that sometimes when you're going through something, you feel like you're the only one. Have you ever felt like you're the only one that sinned? Have you ever felt like you're the only one that's going through a marriage issue? Have you ever felt like you're the only one whose kids are driving you crazy? You're in church today. You came in, and you saw the perfect family with their kids all walking around like ducks in a row. Mama duck bringing them downstairs. You know, they're all dressed. They're all matching. They all got the same bow ties, bows in their hair, all the kids' hairs in place. And you look at them, must be nice. Meanwhile, you didn't know that the mother had to, like, mount one of the kids to put the bow in their hair, tranquilize them with some Benadryl. You know what I mean? They're all like sitting there with happy time cough medicine walking in there like that. But you, you don't know what got them there. Comparison is the thief of joy. Stop comparing yourself to everybody. Here's the deal. Every couple has marriage issues. Stop comparing yourself to everybody else's marriage. Rachel and I fight dirty. Uh, Marie and Joe. I'll leave that up for you to disclose. You know, we all got issues. We all have failed as husbands and wives. Stop comparing yourself to everybody else and stop feeling isolated. You're the only part. There's people in this room that have lost loved ones. There's people in this room that have messed up and sinned. There's people in this room that have felt desperately alone. And here's the deal. What does scripture say? It's talking about persecution, but it's, it's so much more than that. It says the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Look at somebody and say, you're not alone in this life. We're going through it together. We're going through it together. Listen, we've all lost loved ones. We've all gone through COVID. 
We've all walked through all the seasons together. We've gone through things collectively. You've lost people. You, some of you have battled cancer. I know there's some of you in this place. You've even gone through diverticulitis. All the diverticulites, come on, holler at me if you hear me. You know, like, I'm not the only one in the world that's been in a hospital. I may be the only one in this room that's been in an Italian ambulance, praise the Lord. Wasn't that romantic on our anniversary? Come on, I, I spared no expense for that ride. They still haven't given me a bill in Italy. I may not be able to get back in the country. You know, like, <laughs> sorry, no. <laughs> um, but you got to understand that isolation is a tool of the enemy to make you think you're the only one going through it. But Jesus died for all of our sins. He died for all of our iniquities. He died for all of our sorrows. And by his stripes, we are healed. Amen. And when you trust God, you realize every trial has an expiration date because this is what scripture says. And it says this, and the grace of God who called you to his eternal glory. Read this with me. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice that? After you have suffered a little while, there is victory. Amen. How many people have seen the worst things you ever thought would have happened to you really didn't happen to you? How many people in the middle of something you felt like it was over? Oh, but just as Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. Come on now. He who began the work in you will carry it through to completion just by a show of hands. How many people in the middle of it you thought it was over, but then God showed you after you suffered a little while, he restores you. You actually become better than you were before. The very thing that was meant to harm you, God used for good for the saving of many souls. Is there anybody that can testify that his word proves true? And so the next thing about Trust is that complete trust and reliance on God is vital in a relationship with him. Nahum 1.7. How many people even know Nahum was in the Bible? Nahum. The Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. And listen to this. He cares for those who trust in him. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, Rachel used to give this to me when I was coming out of the ashes of my failures. He says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is steadfast because they trust in you how many people know the antidote for for worry is, is perfect peace and perfect peace comes when we trust him and it says trust in the lord forever for the lord the lord himself is the rock eternal he's the final boss thank you Matthew 10, 28 to 31 talks about your value because one of the things that happens when we don't trust God is we don't trust what he says about us. And in Matthew 10, 28 to 31, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not, not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Look at all you with your luscious hair. Look at that. Denzel, still got it after all these years. Incredible metabolism and a full head of hair. I'm jealous. And you're, you're tall, too. But look at you guys with your hair. All good. For most of you, it's all your hair, right? I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I used to go to my social studies teacher back in junior high, Dr. Gallo. I'd be like, Doc, is that a toupee? And he would say this, no, I didn't have a toupee. I got in for free. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but I look at Robert Gross. Look at myself. I look at the members of the ball community, Brother Ben, with your harmonica. All the members of the ball community unite. Not only does God know the hairs that we have left, but he knows what happened to all the ones that fell off. <laughs> but when I think about that, I think about how intimately God knows me. He not only knows what I have, he knows what I lost. He knows what makes me. He knows what makes you. If, you know, 
I don't think, come on, like, aside from being a curious kid, when have you ever worried, wondered how many strands of hair do you have on your head? Like, I don't even think I really even thought about it, and I'm bald, okay? I cry over what fell off my head, but I never thought about the number of hairs, right? And do you realize something that may be insignificant to us is significant to God? And when you don't abide in the beauty of Jesus or have fellowship in the Holy Spirit, you start to make assumptions about how God feels about you. But when you look intently into the word that gives life, you actually start to see the truth of what God believes about you, of what God feels about you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. All the days of your life were written in his book before any one of them came to be. He formed you in your mother's womb. You're much more valuable to him than a sparrow. And of the most insignificant things, he knows every hair on your head. And the number it is, this is number 75 of 90. Praise God. But he knows the most insignificant things about you. He knows, and here's the deal. He just doesn't know because how many people know? There's a lot of people that have knowledge but don't have heart. He knows and he cares more than anyone else in the world will. That's why you can trust him. But you don't know this until you start to have a relationship with him in the word, with the Holy Spirit and the beauty of Jesus. And so we go on. One important thing about trust is in the most difficult times, we can commit our plans and situations to the Lord, and we know that he will work things out for the best. Psalm 37, 3, 7 to 3 to 7a, it says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. And what does it say? Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. When we trust God, even in the most difficult times, we know that all things will work out for our best. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things God works together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So it's essential. It's We're going to trust the Lord. Trust is lived out by obeying God's word, walking in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, abiding in the beauty of Jesus. John 15 says, apart from him, we can do nothing. Galatians 5 says that when we walk in the spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, but when we walk in the spirit, we will move in the fruit of the spirit and we will yield that fruit. Amen. So the Holy Spirit is important. It's not your reward for living holy. Your, the Holy Spirit is a companion. The Holy Spirit is a helpmate. The Holy Spirit is a counselor. The Holy Spirit is a friend. Jesus says, I need to go and sit at the right hand of the Father, but I will not leave you as orphans. I will give you the Holy Spirit who will take the things of God and make them known to you. And when we walk by the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit is not someone that just shows up and rescues you like a superhero. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in slinging webs and all of a sudden save you. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you at all times because of the saving work of Jesus Christ. He resides in you because the Bible says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And there's got to be somebody in this place that's getting excited right now because God has given you his word. He's given you abiding in the beauty of Jesus. He's given you fellowship with the Holy Spirit. There's so much for you. If God is for you, no one or nothing can be against you. And in James 1, 22 to 25, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. The beauty of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And I'll try and wrap this up because I feel like we've been drinking from a fire hose and we're at that point now. We're almost like, no mas, no mas. But I want to give you this. If you want to be able to trust God and lean on your own understanding, you got to have an abiding relationship with Jesus. 
He's got to be present in every portion of your life. There's got to be no area of your life that's outside of his lordship, that's not surrendered to him. And here's the deal. The only way we can do that is by walking with the Spirit. And relationship with the Holy Spirit is so essential. Did you know that we're a Pentecostal church? Do you know that we're affiliated with the Assemblies of God? I'm, a, I'm an executive presbyter with the Assemblies of God. This is a Pentecostal church. And one of my prayers for this church is not that we would be known for the denomination we belong to, although I love the Assemblies of God and I believe it's one of the greatest organizations in the world that's preaching the gospel and it's one of the fastest growing uh, moves of God that's happening all over the globe. I'm grateful for it. I love our covering and our fellowship. But you know what I pray our, our church is known for? A church that is filled with the Holy Spirit, moving in the Spirit, and has friendship with the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. You've got to get over your experience of the Holy Spirit, and you have to realize the Holy Spirit is defined by the Word, not your experience. And that's where we lose it. That's where we go to extremes, where we have groups of people that go to a Pentecostal church, but there is no witness of the Holy Spirit in the service because we want to minimize what we fear because of our experience of seeing people fall out and spin like tops and different things like that. We fear what we don't know. One of the biggest reasons why people are racist is because they're just ignorant. They don't take the time to learn about culture. They don't take the time to learn about people, to realize that, that most people are actually the same. We put our pants on the same way. We jump off the bed straight into the legs and we pull them up, right? <laughs> Ignorance creates fear. And then fear creates a whole lot of assumptions. And by the prophet Felix Unger, when you assume, you could just figure the rest of it out if you watch The Odd Couple. You make something out of you and me. I'll edit that out for the director's cut. Amen. But your understanding of the person of the Holy Spirit cannot be defined by your experience. He is defined by his word. And the Bible says that he is in us. And when you start to have a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit as he is defined in his word, then a move of the Spirit doesn't become fearful to you then speaking in tongues does not become fearful to you because it is quantified by the word and the giver of the gift is already alive in you. So therefore, when the Holy Spirit moves at the altar, how about this? When the Holy Spirit moves in your house, when the Holy Spirit moves at, at your, uh, at, on your children. Do you know I found out uh, the, the, this week how my son Dominic was baptized in the Holy Spirit? I can't remember what led up to it, but he was in the car on the side of the house House, waiting for his aunt to bring him to some place and drive him someplace. Sarah was living with us, and my son began to speak in tongues in the driveway of our house in the car. When you are not afraid of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will meet you everywhere. The Holy Spirit will be with you. The, the Lord said that when you're brought before the courts and you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. The person of the Holy Spirit is more than just goosebumps and manifestations that that happened in a service. The purpose of the move of the Holy Spirit where, where the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room and they began to speak in tongues and everyone heard the gospel in their own language. And they didn't keep it in that room. They brought it outside the room. 3,000 people were saved and then they were persecuted and they had to move from Jerusalem to Antioch and when they were persecuted, God spread the church and through the power of the Holy Spirit is why we're here today. So you have to become a friend of the Holy Spirit. What's your favorite movie? Come on, I'm going to come in here. Dan, you know I, I, I come to you for all things cinema. Anything? Godfather. The Godfather. Number three? Number one. Number one. All right. Dad, since Denzel gave his, what's yours? Well, I'm a big fan of West, Westerns, The Searchers with John Wayne. The Searchers with John Wayne. Anybody else, John Wayne? Okay, Dad, you're the only one, but we love you. Amen. Okay, The Searchers with John Wayne. Let's go. Here we go. Uh, equalizer. The Equalizer. All right, this is good. We're a little bit better than the first service. They were giving me stuff like The Sound of Music. 
Look at all like G-rated movies. Come on, come on, John, give me something. Usual Suspects. The U Kaiser So Say. Yeah. All right, come on, come on, uh, Mayor of Floral Park. Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank Redemption. Man, you guys are deep westerns and Equalizer. Die Hard's a Christmas movie. Did you know that? <laughs> Mr. McLean. All right. Anyway. Anchorman. Anchorman. God bless you. Amen. On TBS, the save version. Okay. Who said Die Hard? One, two, or three? Okay, good. Good. Nakatomi Plaza. Last one. What's, what's your favorite movie? Oh. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The good, oh, there we go, Dad. Good, Bad, and the Ugly. There's, and I know everyone's dying to hear what Philip Maggie's favorite movie is. Was it The Land Before Time? <laughs> Courageous? What? McGee and Me, the musical? What? Okay, okay. Norma, go ahead. I don't have one. She doesn't have one. They watch movies every weekend, but apparently they don't have one. All right, I got one hand in the back, and then I'm coming back up. We got to actually make sense of this. Go ahead. Avengers. The Avengers! <laughs> nice. Could you imagine if we had a multiverse where there was other us's? All right, come on. I'm going to give you one. Here we go. I don't have one. Okay, there's three people in the, in the church that don't have one, and you need to give them suggestions of where they can go after church to watch their movie. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> but here's the deal. Remember back in the day when DVDs came out and then you could get uh, the director's cut that would have an audio channel that you could put on that while you're watching the movie, you can listen to the director and some of the cast talk about the scenes and how they all came together. And so you could watch the movie and then you could have the director who directed it and the writer and the producers and some of the stars talk about the movie. But that's one way where they're speaking to you but you don't have any chance to answer, ask questions. But with the Bible, the Holy Spirit penned the word. And when you read the Bible, you have the opportunity to have a c conversation, not one way, but two way, a conversation with the author of the word. How blessed are we? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. In order to trust, you have to have relationship. Relationship with the Word, relationship with Jesus, and relationship with the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that have been in settings that have made you uncomfortable, and your only view of the Holy Spirit is what you saw, and you didn't understand it, and because you didn't understand it, you put a limit on it, and you kind of just walked away, and you said, I'm good with Jesus, I'm good with God, Holy Spirit, you just show up, and if it gets weird, I can go to the bathroom. I'm telling you, get back in the Word. Read about the person of the Holy Spirit and his role in your life. Realize that when you accepted Jesus in your heart, he's already in you. So you can't run from the Spirit because he's already in you. Get to know who's in you. Have fellowship with your friend, the Holy Spirit. And as you start to know the Holy Spirit, you start to know the Word. As you start to know the word, you start to know Jesus. And when you abide in the beauty of Jesus, having fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and you have that now relationship, you start to build trust. And you need to realize that God is with you, not just in the hard moments, and, and he's with you every moment. He's with you when you sleep, and he intercedes the Holy Spirit on your behalf when you don't know what to say. How many people know we can sleep because God neither slumbers nor sleeps? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I wish, I wish, right? I wish that when I had that 19-year-old life-shattering moment. How many people know when you're 19 and you haven't lived much life, I thought that that was it. It was, every, it was my whole world. I felt like my whole world was coming crashing down. But then I saw that God had the most amazing partner I could ever ask for. You guys don't know how blessed you are that she's my wife. Because <laughs> she prays for me. She loves me enough to tell me the truth. She lifts up my arms. 
God uses her to speak into my life. And I thought that God had nobody for me. And in 1996, when I said I was crazy about her, and she said, I love you too. Well, she said, no, she didn't say that then. I think it was a week later because you couldn't resist me. <laughs> Let's just face it, the riz was, the riz was ridiculous. Oh, she said the riz was good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <clears throat> but what I'm saying is, I wish that me seeing the hand of God move so profoundly and powerfully in my life would allow me to trust him for everything else that was down the road. But you also need to understand greater level, greater devil, that victory on one level promotes you to fight on the next, and that I have to go back to that scripture and back to my relationship with the Lord and back to fellowship with the Holy Spirit so that later on when we were pregnant with Dominic and they told us he would have Down syndrome and water on his brain and water on his kidney, that we had to go back to trust in the Lord and lean on in your own understanding. That when I had to go for my second CAT scan or my third CAT scan for my intestines and colon because I had another flare up, you know, I was thinking, is there something there now that the doctors didn't see? I went to the GI doctor and she said, sometimes diverticulitis can mask a tumor. Now here I am. This is like two weeks ago. And here I am, I'm typing in in Google. I'm looking at his all these things and, you know, and then they get me the report and here I am typing in what the words I had no understanding was. Thank God for Philip to, to read my CAT scan results. But I, I had myself having cancer, kidney failure, uh, you name it. And I got the report, kidneys unremarkable, lungs unremarkable. I was never happy to be so unremarkable. <laughs> but I had to go back to that verse, lean not on your own understanding. See, sanctification is a process, and God's got you on the journey, and he's forming you on the potter's wheel. And he takes you from glory to glory, but in between, he, uh, he teaches you. And I want you to hold on to this. After you have suffered a little while, God's going to bring it to completion. Everything you're going for or going through has an expiration date. And most of the times... 99.9% .9 of the times, the worst thing you ever thought would happen hasn't happened. Am I right? God has actually come through. You look at what you went through and you thank God for it. And it becomes a building block on your life. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it builds a harvest if you allow it to teach you. How many people are thankful that even in the midst of the fire, God is with you and he forms you and he teaches you? So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path.